coming up next on Small Town Big Deal. Georgetown, Colorado is about to get its Christmas on. <laughs> and they're bringing a whole new meaning to the term Rocky Mountain High. And then... A tradition that's more than 100 years old that'll have you cruising your way to a port of call that's a light show free for all. Oh, ho, ho! You know, Dan, I love how different communities celebrate Christmas in their own way. Well, one great spot we found is Georgetown, Colorado. It's way up high in the Rockies. They really embrace their European heritage. And when it comes to Christmas celebrations, they take that heritage and put it on a red carpet. That's right, which is pretty remarkable considering the town nearly vanished 100 years ago. <laughs> It's like you've been dropped back into the Victorian era. Merry Christmas, everyone. Georgetown does such a wonderful job keeping the Victorian Christmas alive every year. Merry Christmas! The town just creates that feel and the warmth of Christmas almost year round. Ho, ho, ho! <laughs> Georgetown, Colorado is dressed up and ready to party. Sitting at an altitude of 8,500 feet, the air may be a little thin, but it's thick with the spirit of Christmas. There's just this sense of like reciprocal joy. It's infectious. The Christmas spirit here is infectious. Georgetown, with a population of just over a thousand, sits about 40 miles west of Denver. 11,000 foot peaks almost stand vigil over Georgetown. And if they could talk, they'd tell the tale of the little town that could. So Georgetown started in 1859. There's lots of silver. And the thing about silver is our government was backing our money, our paper money with silver. So silver mining unearthed a wave of prosperity, drawing people here to a better life. But the good times were not destined to last. 1893, our government repealed the silver standard, which basically meant our town went into a depression. For Georgetown, it was the end of an era. In the 40s, you know, where it really started being questionable whether this was gonna turn into a full-fledged ghost town. But the end of silver mining sort of had a silver lining. The good news about that is we have these houses that were preserved through really tough times because people were not able to update their homes, their properties, so there was a lot of natural preservation going on. Those who remained loved the town's charm. But in the late 1950s, a new interstate was planned to cut right through the heart of Georgetown. It was going to destroy the beauty and the history and the architecture. So to keep the interstate out, the town declared itself a national historic landmark. Today, the beautiful Alpine mountains, the preserved Victorian architecture, and a rich Swedish heritage make it easy to get wrapped up in Georgetown. The centerpiece of the Georgetown Christmas weekend celebration is the European-style open-air market. Hi. Oh, you look fabulous, darling. Look how beautiful those are. I've been making these for about 23 years. And then the ideas exploded. I do over 180 themes. This is not a secret or anything. This is a two by two block. But you turn it, you know, at 45 degrees. So the nose is already there. So what I love about the marketplace is that when you're buying something, you're buying it from the person that made it with their own hands. The air in this open air market is a downright cold 17 degrees. But the crowd stays warm. Oh, that fire feels good. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about and keeps their bellies full. The Bavarian pretzels, they look good. Anything hot right now sounds really good. Are those actually roasted chestnuts on an open fire? On an open fire. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Frost is nipping at my nose. Definitely. Yuletide carols being sung by the fire. fire. <laughs> we actually did pretty good, I think. On the song? 
Well, considering what a bad singer I am, that didn't sound so bad. Now, to make the season right. So after all these years, I can actually say I've had a chestnut roasted on an open fire and sang the song at the same time. Many ways, Merry Christmas to you. I am still re-sang the whole song. <laughs> Then at noon, the town's Swedish heritage truly shines with a Santa Lucia procession. This tradition dates to 18th century Scandinavia, celebrating light during the long and dark winter nights of Northern Europe. All the children wear white robes, red sashes around. Cora Lou Anderson keeps the tradition alive in Georgetown. Santa Lucia. A sixth grader portrays the Queen of Light. She's the one that dons the wonderful crown with the candles. They have to sing in Swedish. They sing the Santa Lucia in Swedish. Is that hard Sometimes. to learn? It is. The kids also sing more familiar tunes. And with ginger snaps in hand, it's hard not to get caught up. On the down in the chimney with a picnic. That's really great because it's really bad. Up next, sweaters, sweets, and some Santa time. If he's been naughty most of the year, does he still have time before Christmas to be nice? Santa's answer when we return to Small Town Big Deals Christmas Across America. But first, a little Christmas quiz. Nat King Cole was the first to record the Christmas song, and his version remains by far the most popular. Mel Torme and Bob Wells wrote the beloved classic. How long did it take them? 45 minutes? A day? Two months? Or one year? Your answer when we come right back. The answer to our Christmas quiz. How long did it take to write the Christmas song? You guessed 45 minutes. You are correct. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal in Georgetown, Colorado. And if Christmas excites you and the mountains thrill you, well, what they've got here is a true Rocky Mountain High. At 8,500 feet, you might say Georgetown truly elevates the spirit of the season. And that spirit's fun side snaps into focus with a quick stop at the town's ugly sweater photo booth. That's really great because it's really bad. I mean, if you're going to do it, you got to do it. Five seconds in between each and... This booth might be one of the few places in Georgetown with a link to Christmas present. Merry Christmas, everyone. Because a walk along the streets is like a portal to a Christmas past. The homes and buildings could have been plucked right out of a vintage Christmas card. There's one family, the Andersons. Their family has been here from the beginning. They have a store in town. They're very proud of their heritage. Thank you. Well, our great-grandfather came here as a baker. Through the years, it had the family, somebody's always stepped up to kind of take care of it. Today, Nizel and Anderson is run by three of Henry Nizel's great-grandchildren. Growing up, I remember stores like this, and I love the wooden shelves and the creaky floors. I mean, it brings me back a long way. It's like shopping at the UN. Okay, so Norway, Sweden, Scotland, advent calendar from Germany. Thank you, now. And I think that's what this store embodies too, is that people poke around and, and see things on the shelves. And a lot of times it takes them back to growing up in the traditions that they had. You speak Swedish, right, Wendy? Yes. So can you teach Jan and I to say Merry Christmas in Swedish? Yeah. It's real simple. Good Yule. Oh, I got that. <laughs> Good Yule? Yeah, I got that. Good Yule. If Nizel and Anderson is this town's Yuletide grocery hotspot, then this home could easily be the town's holiday sweet spot. These pastries are the creation of Faye Fisher, who the town has deemed its official Christmas lady. And it's easy to see why. Welcome to Christmas in Overdrive. Inside Faye's home are no fewer than 12 Christmas trees, along with countless knickknacks at every turn. 
were ready for her to school us in baking a Christmas cookie favorite, a recipe handed down from her grandmother, the chocolate drop. You can always tell a great cook by a well-used recipe card. Gradually. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we start with three quarters of a cup of sugar and my favorite, one stick of butter. Mm -mm -mm. I like butter, but Jan loves butter. That's a pretty cool little machine. Yeah, you like machines. I was thinking you? I could use that in my shop to mix paint or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing is the baker's chocolate. You have to put this in the microwave for 30 seconds. Okay. okay. What I usually do is just kind of stir it up a little bit. Because you don't want to heat it too much. No, then it'll get curdly. I really don't like my chocolate curdly. And then it calls for one and three-fourths cups of flour, a cup of milk. Now we need some baking soda. Here's an easy way to do it. You just stick it in here oh, yeah. and level it off at the top, see? Yeah, you've done that a few times. <laughs> Another half teaspoon of salt. So would I do it kind of the same way? Is that the half? Nope, that looks like the fourth. Oh. And then the last thing is the teaspoon of vanilla. And then okay. mix her up and start yeah. dropping them on the cookie sheet. Okay, Jen, I'll let you have the honors. <laughs> well, that's well, a lot. I got a lot. I got that's a big one. No, that, that, that's a lot. <laughs> Are you trying to mess it up? Jan? Yeah. Rodney's. Jan's. Jan's. Just about perfect. Rodney's. All right, eight minutes in the oven. So this one is my tribute to the Rocky Mountains. For once cooled, we frost them with Faye's secret frosting. Have you ever done this before? <laughs> never. You've never done this before? Well, have you changed the oil in a 1066 tractor before? <laughs> you never have? <laughs> and then we indulge a bit with Georgetown's very own Christmas lady. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, to Christmas and cookies. Oh. Faith, thanks so much for your help. What a great spread. I you get a lovely coming. home. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. But you think I'm leaving before I get some cherry pie? <laughs> Probably not. Uh -uh. And if you're seeking out the man known for snacking on cookies during his Christmas Eve all-nighter... Ho, ho, ho! <laughs> you can find him just like we did riding the Georgetown Loop Historic Railroad. Good thing, because I have a question for old St. Nick. If he's been naughty most of the year, does he still have time before Christmas to be nice? Yes, there's time to recover. No! Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Dashing through the snow in a long voice open sleigh. Hey! The Georgetown Loop takes an hour. It's full of song and stunning views and rich history of the railroad. As the sun sets, nighttime riders will experience the train and train station all lit up, making the visit even more magical. If Christmas love was something you could see, it might look a lot like Georgetown, Colorado in December. For this small town is truly a wonderful place to celebrate the most wonderful time of the year. Coming up next. A tradition that's more than 100 years old that'll have you cruising your way to a port of call that's a light show free for all. We'll be right back with more Small Town Big Deals. So, hey, don't touch that remote. Here you go. Oh. Nothing like a cup of hot chocolate to warm your insides. <laughs> yeah, with a few marshmallows. Just a few. <laughs> actually, you know, there is a place where a beach actually brings a warm Christmas spirit. A beach? Okay, so I missed something, didn't I? Yeah, you did. You know, every year, thousands head to Newport Beach, California to celebrate Christmas in a way that, well, floats just about anybody's boat. Cheers. This is the Newport Beach Christmas Boat Parade, one of the country's most popular Christmas parades on water. Yeah, all the lights and stuff, so it's really cool. We come every year. And it's just a whole community brought together, which is really pretty to me. It's like a really good idea. And it just shows the holiday spirit in a really beautiful way. Newport Beach is located in Orange County, California, about 45 miles south of Los Angeles. The parade pays tribute to its iconic boating culture and takes place on the inland waters of Newport Harbor with a route that's about 14 miles long. 
The water is so smooth it acts like a mirror reflecting the millions of colorful lights. It's almost like getting two shows. And it's just wonderful to see the expressions on the people's faces when this goes by. They have no idea what to expect and then they see this fantastic glamorous parade go by and they're, they're just blown away. David should know a little something about the boat parade. His grandfather started it 111 years ago. And in his 55 years, David's never missed a single one. Do you think your grandpa would have ever envisioned it would have got this big? In his wildest dreams, I don't think he knew it was going to get this crazy. Um, we're up to 100 plus boats, all sizes from 100 foot down to little kayaks and dinghies. And back in the days when he was starting this, of course, it was a lot of kayaks and rowboats. And, and I don't think he could have ever imagined that it would have turned into this magnificent parade. A hundred years ago, the parade was just a few decorated boats lit with Japanese lanterns. The modern version begins with a fireworks show on a Wednesday, followed by five nights of parading and then ending with more fireworks on Sunday. The New York Times recently named it one of the top ten holiday happenings in the nation. Ho, ho, ho! We'll see hundreds of thousands of people down from the community over the course of five nights. We also welcome people from San Diego, Los Angeles, Inland Empire, and whoever else is out here visiting their family for the holidays. To the city, it means about a $4 million economic impact. Well, I don't know about a sleigh ride, but weather in the 70s is certainly lovely for everything else. Here in balmy Newport Beach, there's singing and dancing and food and endless Christmas parties all around the harbor. And what's a parade without a celebrity grand marshal? This year, it's LA Angels all-star Albert Pujols, who also played for Rodney's beloved St. Louis Cardinals. So Albert, what does Christmas mean to you? Well, this is a reminder, you know, we celebrate the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you know, who died on the cross for our sins so we can have eternal life. So, and to be around with families, you know, uh, and to gather together with food and everything and just catch up uh, great memories. Well, for Rodney, meeting you, Albert, is now a great memory. Plus, wouldn't you know it, he also got a personal tour of one of the most fabulous boats in the parade, the Last Hurrah. We've got a lot of really talented people who have worked to put this all together, from building the structures, to lighting it up, to programming the lights, and then integrating the sound. This year, the last hurrah went with the carnival theme. It includes carnival games, a Ferris wheel, and over 40,000 synchronized lights. Yep, that's 40,000. We actually start in February or March trying to come up with a design plan. That usually takes a couple months to figure out uh, what's going to look good and what's possible to actually put on the boat. And then after that, they start uh, four months in advance of the parade actually building these structures. That's a lot of work. Yeah, but when Sean flips that switch at night, it's all worth it. It might be called the last hurrah, but I guarantee Sean and the ship will be back next year probably was something even bigger and better. It's kind of like that for the boat parade itself. It's been going on for so long, the people of Newport Beach can't imagine Christmas without it. I wonder, what will it be like in another hundred years? <laughs> We're getting the hang of it now. Whoa, maybe not. We hope you've enjoyed this special wintery Christmas edition of Small Town Big Deal. I'm trying to catch up. You know, I want to know, do you think they can get any more lights on those boats? In Newport Beach, where there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet my hero, Albert Pujo. In Georgetown, Colorado, the narrow gauge train bridge with Santa, the Santa Lucia parade, and making Christmas cookies. <laughs> I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. Let's go. Okay, let's get some hot chocolate. Mm. I don't want to share the recipe. <laughs> uh -oh. Is that a family secret? Yes. And I'm not one of those who would give the recipe and leave out an ingredient. <laughs> oh, people have done that. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah, I'm sure my family secrets have nothing to do with food or recipes.